Welcome to Element if you're new. There are Bibles in the seat backs in front of you. If you don't own one, you can have one. If you forgot one, you can use one. Uh, there are sermon notes and all the communion tables throughout the room. They look like this. And this time they're a little different than the last ones because this time you're getting a half page that's going to recount what we talk about today. And on the other side, you'll get questions to talk to your family, your friends, your gospel community about. On the back, you'll get the verses that we will hit and go through today. Then you get this question right here and it says, this week I can apply this lesson to my life in these ways. And then maybe think and pray through that this week and then come to something and write that down so you have that. And then on the bottom, there's a place to actually put your notes. And I understand that if you are someone who takes a lot of notes, you know, throughout these weeks and stuff like this, you're going to have a million of these by the, by the time, you know, we get to the end of a series like this. It's like, where do I put all these? You can scan them, digitize them. I don't know. We just want to help to reinforce what we talk about and go through today. So you can have those. Uh, if you have a smart device, you can download an app. It is called Uversion. Uh, when you download it, it just says Bible. And you click on that and you click on more and then events. And we will come up by GPS in your smart device and you will get the sermon notes, the verses, the questions, the announcements, and really all that we go through today. My name is Aaron. I'm one of the pastors at Element. Why don't you stand with me for the reading of God's word? And this is James chapter 1 verses 2 and 3. And it says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Let's pray. Uh, Father, today we ask that you would teach us to be a people who trust you no matter what we walk through in our lives. These trials, this, this suffering that we tend to go through as part of normal life. Uh, these places in the midst of COVID where things shut down and we don't know what tomorrow is supposed to look like, that we would come to a place where we trust you and your goodness over us through each step of that, and that you would be honored and glorified. Amen. Have a seat. All right, so we, as I said, are starting a brand new series of this New Testament book called James. I actually started to write the book of James about when we were finishing uh, Book of Acts Part 2. If you were here for the Book of Acts, like the first part, it was like five or six years ago. And what we did is we went chapters 1 through 12. And then... Four, five years later, we did part two and did chapters 13 through 28. And if you put those two things together, it was 97 weeks, 79 weeks, 79 weeks. Really long, longest series we've done if you put it all together. Now, I tell you that to let you know the book of James is only going to be 19 weeks. You're welcome. <laughs> But it is only five chapters, so that's how we're going to roll with this. Um, we're going to finish just after Easter, and after Easter, we'll start this series called Never Read a Bible Verse. And that's not meant to tell you not to read your Bible. What it is is read your Bible in context. Don't just take one verse out of here or one little thing. Look at what the entire scriptures say. Never read a Bible verse. But today, we're going to start with the book of James. I'm going to give you some background information of what we're walking through, and I think it's also going to tie in with the Songs of Ascent that we went through. Uh, when I was writing this message, it was right at the end of the presidential election, and James, the first verse, talks about trials, and there's all kinds of different types of trials that, that come along with that. Well, it's it's going to be so much fun. Anyway, uh, the book of James has almost universal agreement that it was written by Jesus' half-brother James. Now, we say half-brother because they had the same mother, Mary, but obviously the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary when Jesus was born, and so Jesus was born of a virgin. Uh, Joseph was the father of James and Jesus' other siblings. But so people say, you know, this is written by Jesus' half-brother James. There are some people who disagree with that, but those disagreements can be overcome with historical reasoning. Now, so we're going to talk about James' half-brother, but think about that. What does it take to get your half-brother to worship you as Lord God Almighty? My brother and I growing up, we called each other lots of names, but none of them was ever Savior, Redeemer, or Lord. We thought the other person may have actually been born as the spawn of Satan, but not as the Son of God. So James is like all of us. He starts off as an unbeliever, as we all do. We, none of us are born being a Christian. John 7, verse 5, for not even his brothers believed in him. What made the difference in James? Well, James saw that Jesus died for his sin, was buried in a tomb, raised himself from the grave by his own power, and that's what it takes. We are told that in the 40-day period between when Jesus rose from the grave and before the ascension, that he actually appeared to James. In 1 Corinthians 15, 7, it says, Jesus appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and James believed. 
And he ended up becoming the ruler or the, the leader of that church in Jerusalem. James is, is mentioned as being in the upper room with the disciples in Acts 1.13 with Mary and all the rest. That means he is present when the Holy Spirit first comes at Pentecost. James is a guy who knew Jesus like nobody else could. He would have eaten the same meals and eaten at the same table and shared the same house and played in the same places and played the same games. And he would have seen his older half-brother grow up. And when James truly comes to know Christ as his Messiah and Redeemer and Lord, he is nicknamed James the Just. The historian Eusebius recounts this. He says, James used to enter alone into the temple and be found kneeling and praying for forgiveness for the people so that his knees grew hard like a camel's because of his constant worship of God, kneeling and asking for forgiveness for the people. So from his excessive righteousness, he was called the Just. James the Just. This book of James is probably the earliest New Testament book that was written. Uh, back in the book of Acts, we talked about this thing that happens in Acts 15, where Paul and Barnabas come to this council in Jerusalem. And as they are reaching Gentiles, the big question for the Gentiles is, do I need to be circumcised to be part of the family of God? And Paul and Barnabas were arguing that they did not need to be. And this council comes back and says, no, they don't need to be circumcised. All the Gentiles heaped a huge sigh of relief, but this book is probably written before that council. And that means what you see in this book is really the beginnings of fleshing out how all the promises of Judaism come to fulfillment in Christ and how that is being laid out in the world. It's written probably before most of Paul's letters were written. And sometimes when people look at James versus Paul, they say, oh, well, James and Paul had different views of what faith versus works look like. And that's not actually true. They actually supplement each other. What James will do when he looks at faith is he will talk about it subjectively. What is faith? Well, faith is trust and confidence in Jesus. When Paul talks about faith, he typically talks about it objectively. Who is the object of our faith? And the object of our faith is Jesus, the instrument by which we are justified before God. Those are discussions we'll have in a different sermon, not this one, though. And what James will do is really give us a practical understanding of how faith begins to be worked out in the world. There's a whole bunch of practical admonitions throughout it. It continues nonstop. Uh, E.J. Goodspeed once called the book of James a handful of pearls dropped one by one into to the hearer's mind. Kent Hughes says that the dominant theme is faith that is real works practically in one's life. So it's a practical book. And this is why we are calling the book a faith that works because that works in different ways. If you have a Bible, open to James chapter one. It's on page 654 if you have an element Bible. And you will see in, in the book of Acts, you will see Peter, John, Paul, most of the other apostles, they go out of Jerusalem into the world, but James stays and he steers that early church. He stayed and he taught and he prayed and he led because he believed that the God who raised Christ from the dead would continue that work in God's people. Uh, N.T. Wright says that James looked out and he saw the believers in Jesus as the Messiah as a new version of the 12 dispersed tribes of Israel. He says he encouraged them to face up to the challenge of faith. So how does James start his book? James 1.1, 1, 1. James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. James starts with humility. James does not start with, I am so amazing. Do you know who I am? That's how most of us would start, right? Oh, what's your pedigree? What school did you go to? What church did you work at? What are the things that you learned? When, sometimes people come to Element and they do that. The first thing they say is, well, what school did you go to? And what have you written? And what have you done? And what churches have you worked at? James starts in humility, but he could have started that way. He could have started, I am James the Just. I am from the sacred womb of Mary. I am a half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's why you should listen to me. But he doesn't do that. He says, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe he should have been called James the Humble. We could all use a little bit more of that humility, by the way. Now, James does see himself as a pastor. Who is he right to? The 12 tribes in the dispersion. Now, let me explain what this means if you don't know what that means. The Jews scattering into the world is known as the diaspora. Uh, last summer, we went through this series through the minor prophets. And the minor prophets all foretell what God is going to do in and among his people. So what happens is you have like uh, King David reigns, then King Solomon reigns in Israel, and then King Solomon's son, Rehoboam, starts to reign. And Rehoboam taxes the northern tribes heavily. And the northern tribes come to Rehoboam, 
And they say, hey, can you lessen our tax burden? And Rehoboam says, well, no, I'm going to show you how much more of a man I am than my dad ever was. He says it in a very vulgar way. And he says, I'm going to raise the taxes on you even more. And the Northern Tim's tribes essentially say, well, we're out. And so the Northern Tim tribes separate. This is a 900 BC. Here's a map. And the Northern Ten Tribes split off. The Northern Ten Tribes will call themselves Israel. The Southern Two Tribes are known as Judah. The Northern Ten Tribes never had one godly king. And God eventually disciplines them in 722 B.C. by sending the Assyrians through that area. And basically wiping them out and hauling others off into captivity. But the Southern Kingdom of Judah stayed there until 587. Now they had a couple of godly kings along the way. But mostly they weren't. And God will discipline them by sending the Babylonians in. And the Babylonians just kind of wiped them out. In 586, they destroyed the temple. They kept capture anybody else who has fled, and then they hauled them off. Now, this is not a surprise to God. It is not a surprise to God's prophets. They'd been foretelling this was going to happen because the people were not walking how God called them to in the world. But the prophets also said in 70 years that these people would return and rebuild their temple. And that's exactly what happened. During that 70 years, the Medes overtake the Babylonians, who are overthrown by the Persians in 539 BC that happens and it's during that Persian reign that the Jews are granted permission to come back and rebuild their temple but not all the Jews returned most of the ones that returned were from the tribe of Judah which is why today we call Jews Jews because they're from the tribe of Judah but many more stayed in Babylon, and the ones the Assyrians took off were scattered all over the place. And so what you see is the dispersion of all these people dispersed all over the ancient world, where they spread in Mesopotamia and the Mediterranean, Asia Minor, and up into Europe. This is why in the book of Acts, when Paul goes out and does these missionary journeys, he starts running into all these synagogues and all these places really at the ends of the earth because the Jews had been dispersed. And I think God did that so the gospel would go out and go Forward, many large cities in James's day had population centers of Jewish people. In the book of Acts, you read about this. James will talk about these. He calls them, first off, there's the freedmen. And the freedmen were just that. They were former Jewish slaves who had been freed. Or they maybe even purchased their freedom. And that doesn't make sense to us in the West because of how slavery was done in the West. In the West, less than 0.05% of any slave was ever freed willingly. But in James's day, most slaves over the age of 30 were freed. Uh, slaves in James's day could have other slaves. They could actually even own property. But these are the freedmen. They are, they are slaves who are freed and they're Jewish and they're in the world. There's also called the Cyrenians. Those are the places from Cyrene, when uh, that's in northern Africa, it kind of butts up between uh, the desert of Egypt and Africa. Simon, who carries Jesus' cross when he stumbles, is from this area. The Alexandrians are from Alexandria. They are very Greek, but there's a large population of Jews there. Uh, the Cilicians uh, are another group, not the Princess Bride, that's the Sicilians, but you know, the, the, the Cilicians, geographically, it's this high area between Syria and the west, native country of the Apostle Paul who was Jewish, and then you have the Asians. And when I say that, that's actually what Acts says. I don't say you can't say the Asians. Well, the book of Acts does. And it's, and it's not just Japan or Korea or China. It refers to those where the seven books or the seven churches from the book of Revelation were written to, Asia Minor, that's what it's referring to. So you have Alexandria, Judea, Samaria, the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, you will have Stephen, the first martyr in the book of Acts, who Saul, who becomes the apostle Paul, oversees his execution. And when that happens, all these people who believe in Christ start fleeing Jerusalem. And you have all these other places where people start believing Jesus is the Messiah. And as they do, other Jews around them refuse to accept them. And they would start to be drawn into court by different Gentiles. And they had no rights when they were drawn into these courts. They ended up becoming homeless and disenfranchised and robbed of their possessions because they had no rights. This is much like what happened after World War II. And the Nazis went through and they took the Jews and they put them in concentrations camps and they gave their homes and their possessions to other people. After World War II was over, they didn't get to go back to their homes. They went there and someone else was living there. They wouldn't give them their homes back. And this is kind of what is happening to these people here. And this is why James starts this way. To those people in the dispersion, James 1 verse 2, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Nothing. 
Now that has to be a strange way to start a letter, writing to these people who feel like they have lost everything in the world. What does he say? Count it all joy. Does James not really know what's going on with these people? Of course he does. James is in Jerusalem with this humanitarian crisis trying to feed these different people who are coming into Jerusalem because they're starving. N.T. Wright says this, the moment you decide to follow Jesus is the moment to expect trials to begin. So he says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. We don't understand this because when we read that verse, we want to focus on the word joy. And yet the focus in the verse is on the word count. Now, I really like how the NIV translates this because it uses the word consider and consider is a much better word here. Consider these ideas in this trial. It means before you face the trial, before you focus on the trial, think about what it actually means and think about what God has actually done in the world to bring you to himself. James is not a masochist. He's not saying, yeah, go find some trials. Oh, they're so much fun. He says, you don't have to consider your trials joy. He says, consider it all joy when. And so what does he really mean when he says that? Well, first off, you have to understand what he does not mean. James is not saying that you have to have an all-encompassing, joyful emotion when severe trials come your way. He's not saying you have to enjoy the trials, or that the trials are joy. He's pointing to what the writer of the book of Hebrews says. In Hebrews 12, 11, For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. James is not saying you celebrate when the job you are going for is given to someone else, not you, meaning less qualified, right? Because it's not you. Or he's not saying you throw a party when you get cancer or a friend of yours gets COVID. What he is commending is a conscious embrace of a uniquely Christian understanding that any and every trial, any and every suffering that we go through in our lives can grow us and glorify God. That's what he is saying. This is what we consider. Consider it all joy that God is doing something in the world. It means to take a deliberate and careful decision to experience joy even in times of trouble. And joy does not mean happiness. It's not like, woohoo. Joy is a deeper understanding of the grace of God that has rescued and saved us. And I know you're asking, well, is that even possible? The answer from the scriptures is yes, it's completely possible. Paul tells the Corinthian church, 2 Corinthians 7, 4, In all of our affliction, I am overflowing with joy. That's not happiness. That's a deep abiding joy because what God has done to bring us to himself. In the book of Acts, Luke says that the Jewish ruling council, the Sanhedrin, brought in James and John and had them flogged and beaten and said, Stop talking about Jesus. And it tells you that the apostles left the Sanhedrin, Acts 5, 41, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. They rejoiced, not that they were beaten, but that they were called to spread who Christ was into the world. Later in Acts 16, you have Paul and Silas. They're talking about Jesus. A mob goes after them and beats them, and they get arre- they're the ones getting beaten, and they get arrested, and they get thrown into the lowest part of the prison. That is a terrible place to be. The lowest part is where all the excrement are rolled down to, so it smells terrible. You can probably hardly breathe. And what do they do in that place where they can hardly breathe? They start to sing songs in worship of God. That's the experience James is referring to when he writes these words. Whatever comes our way, we first consider what God could be doing because of it. Years ago, there's a Presbyterian minister called Lloyd Ogilvie. I don't know if you ever heard of him or not, but he underwent the worst year of his life. His wife had five major, major surgeries. She was undergoing chemotherapy and radiation. Uh, Sarah was staff members had departed. Discouragement was profound. And this is what he wrote during that time. The greatest discovery that I have made in the midst of all the difficulties is that I can have joy when I feel like when I can't feel like it. When I had every reason to feel beaten, I felt joy. In spite of everything, God gave me the conviction of being loved and the certainty that nothing could separate me from him because that's where joy comes from. It was not happiness, so it's not woohoo, but a constant flow of the Spirit through me. At no time did he give me the easy confidence that everything would work out as I wanted it on my timetable, but that he was in charge and would give me and my family enough courage for each day. Grace. Joy is always the result of that. That's where joy comes from. The grace of understanding who God is and what he has done in the world. Trials are part of our lives in this world. This is why James says when, 
He doesn't say if. We are told that we can find joy when we're alienated, when we feel alone, or when we have extreme loss. And that joy may look irrational to those around us, but in Christ, it is perfectly rational. So what do we do as we consider it all joy through these trials? Well, we know and think about what they eventually lead to. He says, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So there is a progression that takes place here that moves to lacking in nothing. This means suffering can actually bring things into our lives that weren't there before. It can actually do that because we're incomplete. You ever see a butterfly trying to get out of its chrysalis? Uh, you know, when a little caterpillar, you know, goes in her cocoon and then turns into a butterfly and starts crawling out of it, it's very difficult for them. And sometimes people see this and they're like, oh, we should help that thing out. And they kind of cut open and move. If you do that, that butterfly is never going to have the strength to fly and it will most likely die. It has to go through that pain to get out of that chrysalis. And I think sometimes God looks at us in our lives and he sees certain things that we are lacking. And either he will bring a trial or he will allow a trial for the purpose to strengthen and to grow us into who he is calling us to be. Steadfastness. This is a word we talked about a couple times during the Songs of Ascent. It is two words put together. Hypo, Monet. Those two words. Hypo means hyper, super intense, over the top. Monet means to stand firm. It's not just being like, I think I'm going to be here. It's like I'm going to stand my ground firm because of what God has first done for me. Uh, years ago, well, years ago, like 10 years ago or something like that, they read, try to read to do the Superman movies. And this movie came out called Man of Steel with Henry, Henry Cavill. And he's like, Clark Kenny, I'm going to ruin it for you, but he's Superman. Okay. Anyway, uh, there's this scene in the movie where he's in this diner before he becomes Superman. And someone's picking on this waitress. And he stands up for the waitress. And this redneck's all, well, I'll take you out. And he, and he, goes, and he goes to shove him. And the guy's all, kabam. And he, and he just knocks back off of him because Superman is like, Superman, you're not going to move that guy, right? So boom. Well, that's hypomone. That's, that's standing firm. Nothing moves because it's so strong. I told you in the Songs of Ascent in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, Jesus says to this church, undergoing persecution, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, he commends them. You've kept my word. You're looking towards me, seeing what I have done. Again, it's that word, Hebrews 12, 2. Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He hyper stood the cross. When the cross is like a redneck, bam, Jesus is like, I'm going to take it. And he stands on that cross for every single one of us. And this is why when we look at this and we see what Jesus has done, we can stand in the place of suffering. Those people in the diaspora can look to what Christ has done. That's how we walk through those times because Christ has walked through them for us already. Now, in the early church, in this persecution that took place, they, they would come and they'd arrest Christians and they'd take them before magistrates and judges and rulers. And these people would say, you need to say Caesar is Lord. And they would say, we're not going to say that. You have to say it or you're going to die. And they'd be like, Jesus, King of King and Lord of Lords. So if you're going to kill me, let's get it over with. And the Romans couldn't believe the poise and the grace and the lack of bitterness they saw in these Christians. And that's not from Christians writing about it. That is one Roman governor writing to other Roman governors about it. Like they couldn't believe the strength of these people. That's the practicalness of the gospel as people walk through their trials. Jesus could hyperstand in the face of the cross. The people came to understand who he was and what he had done. Hyper stood persecution. So can we. I talked to you guys about Simon, who becomes Peter. I mean, Jesus takes Simon, the most fanatic, boneheaded of the bunch. And in Matthew 16, 18, he says, I'm going to call you Peter, which means rock. Jesus makes Peter a rock, a immovable. Peter, the guy that keep, can't keep his mouth shut, that makes promises he can't keep and chops the guy's ear off. Peter, in his life, will hyperstand his own execution, pointing to the goodness and the grace of God. Anyone who takes the truth of the gospel into their lives are those who will be able to hyper stand when suffering and trials come. Not that we don't stumble, but we'll be able to look and see what Christ has done and walk through those things. The rationale of James goes further. It says, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. This is a way of saying that perseverance produces maturity. The NIV says it like this. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. 
as Western thinkers, we read that word perfect and we think, but I'm not perfect and I've been through trials. What's going on with me? Is something wrong with me? How it would have been understood in that day when James wrote that is mature. This refers to a personality that God is doing a work in. Peter David writes this, Perfection is not just a maturing of character, but a rounding out as more and more parts of the righteous character are added. The idea that our maturity, it is not one and done. It is a dynamic wholeness as God works through all the pieces of our lives. And there are thousands of them as God hones them and shapes them and tempers them and brings them all together. And it makes this dynamic wholeness of what he does every single day. All the things that we go through, God is using for his glory and our good. These are the things that we consider as we walk through these trials. Tim Keller once commented this. He says, I don't know how you develop these four things, humility, freedom, compassion, and faith without suffering. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it's kind of true. He will talk about the Apostle Paul, who the Apostle Paul was brilliant. He was great in his teaching and his reasoning. But in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul says, because the surpassing greatness of the revelations that I might not be too elated, swollen, puffed up all into himself, God gave me a thorn in the flesh. God humbled the Apostle Paul. Because God gave him so many gifts, God's like, I need to keep you humble. Paul asked God, please take this away from me, whatever it was. We don't even know what it was. And God says, no, my strength is going to be made perfect in your weakness. You will understand my grace better because of what you are going through. I think there's almost no true humility in someone who has never suffered. And suffering is when God allows or he himself even takes something away that we think we have to have. If God allows or takes something away that we don't think we have to have, it's not suffering. Like if I went home today and all the onions and mushrooms are missing out of my fridge, that's not suffering because I don't care one bit whatsoever. It is only suffering when God takes something from us that we think we need to survive. And then God allows that thing to be removed or he takes it away himself and we survive. And we realize we didn't really need that thing. What we only needed was Christ himself. That's what we needed. It's like suffering produces a humility, and that humility will then lead us to a greater freedom. And when we have that freedom, we begin to live in true compassion because of the things that we have gone through, because of the things that we have suffered. And on the backside of that, we can love one another and serve one another more clearly and faithfully. It produces faith. We begin to understand that God's not there to serve us. We serve him and go where he calls us to go. And I think it's true. There is no way to humility, compassion, freedom, and faith. At least any depth of those things that does not come without suffering. No way to be, as James says, complete. Count, consider it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Again, I really like that the NIV says consider. Because consider is considering so many things. And mostly it is how this all relates in the gospel context. It is like when we suffer, we must think about the one who persevered and was steadfast and suffered for us. We consider Jesus in the midst of every single trial. Again, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, let us run with endurance. There's the word, the race that is set before us. Well, how do we do that? He says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. How do we walk through those things? We have our focus and gaze set upon Christ himself. We can learn to have joy in trials because we remember the gospel. I don't know what your favorite movies are. My favorite movies are things like Braveheart or 300 or Marvel movies where someone's always given their life for somebody else to keep them and protect them. Uh, there's this J.R.R. Tolkien book called The Similarian. It's really hard to read, uh, but there are some good things. In it. And one of them is this story between this guy named Huron and a guy named Turgon. And Turgon is trying to save his people to get them to the, the hidden city. And Huron says, I will stand in the gap as these enemies are attacking so you and all these people can get away and be safe. It's like, I will hyper stand for you. I will stand in this place. And so he does. And he stands there and he fights waves after waves of enemies. And he keeps saying, day is going to come. The day is going to come. The day is going to come. Finally, they overwhelm him. And why was he standing the way he was protecting all these people? He says, my love for these people who I'm seeking to save is more important than my life. It's like they destroyed his body, but he never let go of those people. And I love this, but you have to understand all these things are just ripoffs of the gospel. That's all they are. It's like God's story of how he rescues and saves us. But I told you a couple weeks ago, even more than that, we are told that the love that God has for us, it's not because we are worthy. 
It's not because we figured it all out. It, God loves us even when we are unworthy. All these stories and movies and people, they're always loving the ones that they deem as worthy. Christ loves us when we're unworthy. Romans 5, 8, while we're still sinners, while we're still running from him, Christ died for us. While we are weak, while we have nothing, that's when Christ died for us. Why? Because he deemed to love us. The reason Jesus stood and endured the cross, the wrath of God against sin for us, was that he loved us. And on the cross, Jesus doesn't let go. He stands steadfast in his love. And that is what we consider when we face trials of any kind. Jesus doesn't stand there and love us because he finds us so worthy. It's because he deems to make us worthy by the power and the strength of his love. That's what the gospel reminds us of when we face trials. We don't just say, I want to persevere through this to make myself a better person. We persevere because Jesus first persevered for us. If we're always trying to do it in our own strength, I'll make myself better on the backside. We're never going to get there. At some point, we're going to be like, I'm just done. I, I don't want to do this anymore. But if we walk trusting Christ who has already done it for us and walk through it for us, we continue to persevere. Teresa of Avila put it this way. From heaven, the most miserable earthly life will look like one bad night in an inconvenient hotel. And it's so true. Because we understand what God did and is rescuing and saving grace of every single one of us. Because the gospel is not how we figure it out ourselves. The gospel is not us pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. The gospel is that while we were unworthy, while we are suffering, going through trials, many times the trials that we ourselves have brought to ourselves, Jesus came to save us from ourselves and bring us back to himself. And so when James says, when you walk through trials, what I want you to consider is the joy of what God could actually be doing because of that. The strength and the steadfastness as God matures you through these things as you trust him in the midst of all of these things that you go through. After two years of COVID, I, hope, I, I think every single one of you might have had a trial at some point in the midst of this. And really, when we think about how do we handle those trials? How do we, do we lash out? Do we, do we trust God in the midst of it? Are we focused upon ourselves? These trials are good for us as we consider what God has first done because we want to be a people who center ourselves upon him and not ourselves. And this is what James is saying. Consider it as you go through it. What is the trial leading us to? Are we bitter people or are we becoming more hopeful and grace-filled people? Because that's what we are called to be. I'm going to invite the band to come up. As they do, I'm going to invite you to take communion. And again, we understand communion during the time of COVID is, is awkward and weird when you get a cracker that doesn't really taste like a cracker and grape juice that it's purple, you know. <laughs> it's not the greatest in the world, and we understand that. <laughs> but it's, it's the mask. The mask does it. <laughs> Consider it pure joy when you face trials of various kinds. But we take communion as a reminder of what Christ has done. It's a reminder that the trials we face, one, we never face them alone. Two, they never have no purpose. They always have a purpose. God will always do something. Even when it's a trial we ourselves have brought upon our own lives, God will still grow us because he is good in the midst of it. So we take communion as a reminder of Christ's body that was broken, his blood that was shed, how he first endured for us to bring us to himself. So I invite you to do that today. If you need prayer, uh, grab Sarah at the Welcome Center. She'll connect you with one of us. If you're in a place today where your trial just feels overwhelming in your life and you want to pray about it and consider what God could be doing and focus back upon who he is, there's offering boxes next to all the doors. If you're watching online, you can give online. We give simply because God gave so much to us that giving is part of our worship. It's a response to how giving God is. We consider what God has done. And I also encourage you to grab the sermon notes and go through some of those questions and this week reflect over what we've talked about today by reading you know, that, that half-page summary and then going through those questions and maybe how does this apply to me this week? How do all these things, what am I considering? What am I walking through? How do I grow in who Christ is calling me to be? What do we consider first? What Christ has done or ourselves and what we are going through? We consider Christ first in all things because he is good. He's restored us. He calls us back to himself. That is what we consider. And this is really kind of the whole push of the book of James. What are we considering first? 
We want to consider who Christ is first and foremost above all things because he is the center of our worship. Let's pray. Father, this morning we ask that you would take us and remind us of your deep, abiding, amazing grace that has called us to yourself. And we are not denying the fact that there are trials, that there is pain, that there is suffering in the world and even in our lives. But what we want to do is be a people who first consider what you have done by stepping into the midst of our pain and our trials and the places where we are in order to grow us, to bring us back to yourself. Have us understand these things in the context of the gospel, the good news of your saving and redeeming rescue of every single one of us. Father, in the midst of trials, it's so easy to get our eyes upon ourselves and not where they should be. And I ask that you would teach us how to be a people who consider you and what you are doing in the midst of it. That we could maybe even find this joy that comes from an understanding of grace in the midst of our trials. That we would understand that you are a God who never lets us go. Whether there's laughters or tears or sun or rain that we would first consider your saving grace spoken over us. And then we would then go out and encounter the world around us in a growing maturity of steadfastness because we see and hold to and understand the grace of our own rescue. Teach us to be those who do not live for ourselves, but live for you and to serve those around us. We ask this in your son's good name. Amen.